if uh, my time is correct, it's exactly 12 o'clock and as we have committed, we are going to start the discussions around the founding manifesto of the economic freedom fighters. So this is part of the hashtag EFF book club, which uh, was uh, initiated by the political education department of the economic freedom fighters under the capable leadership of Commissar Mbuisen Inclusive. So today we're going to be responding to the questions that were sent to us via WhatsApp, uh, via social media networks, uh, and a variety of other platforms. Uh, those uh, of you would, would send us direct messages. So we're going to be responding to all those questions. So you are all welcome to this engagement. Let us uh, try to get uh, as many people as possible so that will give a, a clearer context uh, in terms of what we are dealing with. Maybe what is important now to deal with is that uh, we should uh, give you the reading list in these 21 days of lockdown due to coronavirus. The reading list is that from the 27th to the 29th, we have been dealing with the EFF founding manifesto and then from the 30th, which is tomorrow until the 1st of April, we'll be dealing with a document which we're going to widely circulate called the Frequently Asked Questions on Marxism. So basically, it gives you a context of all the Marxist concepts which you think you need to properly understand. And then from the 2nd of April to the 4th of April, we'll be dealing with one of the most important books by Vladimir Lenin, Vladimir Ulyanov Lenin, called The State and Revolution. And then from the 5th to the 7th of April 2020, we're going to deal with a book called The Rated of the Earth by Franz Fanon. And then we're going to then deal with a, a document of the EFF from the 8th to the 10th of April, uh, which is basically a document on frequently asked questions on land expropriation without compensation. So we're going to then deal with those issues so that all of us uh, are familiar with regards to all these key questions. And then the next reading will be a book by Ha Jun Chen called 23 Things They Don't Tell You About Capitalism. So we're going to be interacting uh, in that book. And then the last book will be a book by Kwame Nkrumah called Africa Must Unite. So those are the key readings that are going to define all of us in terms of this engagement. And as I've said before, the purpose is to ideologically empower ourselves, is to politically prepare for ourselves, uh, ourselves for the struggles ahead because we cannot be a revolutionary movement that doesn't uh, get guided from time to time by a revolutionary theory. So revolutionary theory is the most important component in a, in a revolution. But just theory without practice becomes sterile. And this is not just some of the things that we are creating ourselves. It is founded on our ideological commitments. So... All of us will know and appreciate that the Economic Freedom Fighters is a Marxist, Leninist, Fanonian organization, meaning that we ascribe and subscribe to those, to those ideological tools of analysis and guide to action. Whatever we do must fall within that uh, revolutionary perspective in terms of uh, what we should do. So all of us, let us engage comrades and ask questions and interact on all these uh, key things that we are dealing with. And just to give you a, the direct quotes of what Karl Marx said about the necessity of theory in a revolution. In a contribution to the cryptic of Hegel's philosophy of law, Karl Marx said that practice without theory is blind and theory without practice is sterile. Theory becomes a material force as soon as it is absorbed by the masses. So that is important that we must not just engage in practical action which is not founded on proper revolutionary theory, but also 
we must not do vice versa because it will be very dangerous. There are a lot of people who just memorize theory but are not involved in any form of revolutionary struggle. So that is part of the things that we must deal with. And Lenin says that without the revolutionary theory, there can never be a revolutionary movement. So we always say that the economic freedom fighters is a revolutionary movement. So we therefore need to always empower ourselves with proper revolutionary theory that will guide all of us in terms of what should happen. Now today we're going to talk to the EFF founding manifesto. And maybe just as a basic, we must start to highlight what are the key things that define the EFF founding manifesto. Why do we start with this document? It's because it is the foundation of the economic freedom fighters. So the, 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 the essence of what the EFF stands for, the manner in which it wants to fight for its battles, its objectives, are contained in the founding manifesto of the EFF. And just a brief historical background, the EFF founding manifesto was adopted uh, in the National Assembly on what is to be done. So in 2013, revolutionary activists, what we called ourselves the economic freedom fighters, uh, which did not have any organizational expression from different streams, from the Congress movement, from a different variety of organizations and, and individual activists, convened a national assembly on what is to be done in Soweto, which had representatives from all provinces, to then ask a, to respond to the question of what is to be done. And the response was to form the Economic Freedom Fighters as an organization, which then adopted a founding manifesto in that national assembly on what is to be done. So it took place on the 26th and 27th July 2018. So 26 July is a very important day in the history of revolutions. So I encourage all of you, uh, whenever you've got time to go and familiarize yourself with uh, the July 26 movement in Cuba, which in 1953 uh, uh, started and began a revolution that later on got to liberate Cuba and, and, and and institute a socialist government which is still in place today. So you would have seen that the benefits of the July 26 movement in Cuba include the fact that Cuba has got one of the most advanced and perfect healthcare systems, which is assisting a variety of countries now in relation to the coronavirus. So if you check the core of the doctors that are helping those who are infected in Italy, in Venezuela, in Jamaica, in various parts of the world is doctors that come from Cuba. And those are some of the benefits that came from the revolution. So as the EFF, we are a July 26 movement that is existing here in South Africa and, uh, and is inspiring a continent and a pan-Africanist movement which is going to liberate the entirety of Africa. So we have said all of us must read the founding manifesto during these last three days. So if you have read a founding manifesto that does not have 138 paragraphs, you are not reading the correct one. So the founding manifesto of the Economic Freedom Fighters has got 138 paragraphs. That basically summarizes key themes in terms of what is the focus of the organization. And what does the Founding Manifesto do? One, it politically and ideologically locates where do we come from. So let's take notes. Number one is that it, allocate, it, it, it locates where do we come from as a people? What is the history of our struggle as a people? Number two, it then deals with the question of where are we currently? So the first part is basically from paragraph one to paragraph seven. And then the second part is where are we currently? What are the current balance of forces domestically and globally? That is paragraph 8 to 24. And then in paragraph 25, there is what is our diagnosis of the current society? So there is 15 diagnoses of our current political conditions. And if you look into those political conditions and you, you understand the diagnosis that is there in paragraph 25, 
will appreciate that it it's it's almost prophetic like a majority if not all of the things that are mentioned there is what is happening and is is going to happen for a foreseeable period of time so that is the third theme that the founding manifesto deals with then the fourth theme is who are we as the economic freedom fighters what is the economic freedom fighters what is this organization that we call is the, the, the economic emancipation movement? What defines it? What is its ideological tools of analysis and guide to action? What do we stand for? What is our relationship to uh, the Freedom Charter, to a variety of other perspectives that came before us? And then the, uh, the, 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 the fourth, if not fifth component, is where are we going? Then the where, we, where are we going speaks to the seven cardinal pillars for economic freedom in our lifetime. The seven cardinal pillars, the non-negotiable cardinal pillars, are at the core of the struggle for economic freedom in our lifetime. We're going to speak to that in a moment. But there's also complementary pillars that then get to emphasize the centrality of all the issues that we are dealing with as the economic freedom fighters. And then the uh, next component then deals with who stands to benefit. It defines the motive forces in the struggle for economic freedom in our lifetime. So motive forces are forces that fundamentally are the forces that stand to benefit in a revolution. They are the ones that drive motion. So motive forces, it's, it's, it's forces that drive the motion, that drive the inspiration. Of the economic freedom fighters and just as an overview in terms of where do we come from we come from a colonial history of colonial conquest by europeans that we as black people in 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 the in, in the geopolitical territory called south africa today in the entire african continent are still a conquered people we are defeated due to colonialism and settlements so the white minorities that came to defeat us, even after wars of resistance, the wars that happened, the wars of dispossessions, we are still a defeated people. And that is reflected on the fact that we do not own the land, we do not own our economy. We have been subjugated in every aspect of our lives. Our language is even the language that we're speaking on now, through now, is not our own indigenous languages. So in, in all expressions of our lives we are a defeated people but we as the economic freedom fighters appreciate that although we are a defeated people there have been struggles over centuries over years that sought to change that defeat to then give us our rightful place where we're going to own our land to own our economy to drive industrialization to have all the things that come with civilization, that come with development. But we, 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 we have not won the battle yet. There are those that fought the battle before us. We always say in the Economic Freedom Fighters that we are in the relay race of the struggle uh, for total emancipation. So those that fought against colonial invasions, they fought, they ran their path, They've handed the buttons to the next generation. So this generation after generation of freedom fighters, this generation even that, that happened, which had a slogan called freedom in our lifetime. And who are those? Is the generation that founded the Congress Youth League in 1944 that uh, was composed of Anton Lambedem, Kulisi Majumbozi, uh, Oliver Tambo, Nelson Mandela. They had taken a button from those that fought before them and they, they fought towards it, a particular direction. This is a generation that fought for freedom under the Black Consciousness Movement, under the capable leadership of Steve Biko. They fought, they ran their path. And there's a, there's a generation of young lions that fought to, to, to render the apartheid machinery ungovernable. And they, they is, uh, there is generations that took they struggle, but in some instances, in this relay race, they did not run to the front, they ran backward. So we, as the economic freedom fighters, are now saying that we are taking the button from a generation that brought about political freedom in South Africa. 
And this is out of an acknowledgement that political freedom without economic emancipation is meaningless. So it, it means nothing that you have been granted the right to vote and, 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 and select your own candidates as councillors, as members of provincial legislatures, as members of parliament, but you do not have control of your own economy. So what we are fighting for now is to have Africans to gain economic ownership and control of all our resources. That is the nature and form of the struggle that we are engaged in. So the reason why we're called the economic freedom fighters is because we're fighting for economic emancipation. We're the only organization, a political party that is a, 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 has put at the center of its struggle the issue of economic emancipation. So that is what we, uh, we, 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 we stand for. And, and at the center of uh, this struggle is to say we, we should reverse all the vestiges of, of colonialism and apartheid. We should change what apartheid and colonialism brought to our shores. That is, that, is, that is what we are fighting for. We need total liberation in a manner that is going to benefit uh, all of us. I just want to just go through and we'll respond later on to the questions that were sent to us. But I want to go through the, the seven cardinal pillars of the economic freedom fighters, the economic emancipation movement. Cardinal pillar number one is expropriation of land without compensation for equal redistribution. That at the center of our struggle is the expropriation of land without compensation for equal redistribution. Currently, the land is owned by the colonial descendants. So the, 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 the defeat that I spoke about earlier is reflected in land ownership that we still do not own our land as a people. Uh, it's just the, the few minorities that are in, in ownership and control of the land. And this is statistically proven by even the Surveyor General and the Department of Land Affairs that illustrates that the white minority, which is less than 10% of the population, own and control uh, uh, more than 80% of South Africa's land. Government uh, or the state owns more or less 14% of South Africa's land. And majority of the land which is owned and controlled by government is land that was previously designated as Bantu stands uh, or homelands. Cardinal pillar number two in the EFF is nationalization of mines, banks, and other strategic sectors of the economy without compensation. That is what it says that we should have the state ownership and control of the mines, of the banks, and other strategic sectors of the economy. What are those strategic sectors? The founding manifesto, when we read further, it illustrates that the, the sasol, the metal steels, because they are very strategic in terms of their role in the economy should be owned by the state. That the logistics, the telecommunications component and infrastructure should be owned and controlled by the state. The fourth pillar, non-negotiable, is free quality education, healthcare, houses and sanitation. So we are fighting for the provision of free quality education free quality education in the manner in which that it is and also advocate for free health care that all of us must gain access to quality health care uh, housing and sanitation and you will realize that there's an interlinked relationship once you want to commit to give people access to quality health care you inevitably have to give them access to proper human settlements to proper and quality water because you cannot just speak about health care outside of the living conditions where people reside. The fifth pillar is massive protected industrial development to create millions of sustainable jobs, including the introduction of minimum wages in order to close the wage gap between the rich and the poor, close the wage gap and promote rapid uh, career paths for Africans in the workplace. That is one of the most important components in terms of uh, what we then uh, have to deal with uh, in, in the in the cardinal pillars. I, I've, I've skipped one pillar which is important. I'm going to go back to it now. But this one of massive industrial development, it's, it's to say that we are exporters of 
raw and semi-processed materials to the industrialized world, to our former colonizers. And that was the purpose of colonialism. So colonialism was not just about national oppression. It was about resource exploitation. It was to say, let us subjugate these territories in Africa, in parts of South America, in other parts of Asia, so that we can gain access to the natural resources. We'll go and manufacture for them and give them back finished goods and products. That is the purpose of colonialism. And the EFF says that let us build an industrial capacity to manufacture and produce our own goods and services. The pillar which I skipped, but the most important pillar which we're going to speak to, because one of the questions that has been asked here via WhatsApp uh, asked that question, is on building state and government capacity which will lead to the abolition of tenders. So what distinguishes us from all these other political parties that are governing now is that we think that government must have its own internal capacity to deliver services. Currently, government in its own design and architecture, it relies on the private sector to provide basic services. So if government wants to build a school, it must call for tenderpreneurs to submit tenders so that they can build the school on behalf of government. If government wants to build roads, if government wants to deliver textbooks or even basic books, everything else that government does, it, it, it outsources or it, it relies on the private sector. And that is why we are saying that we should build internal state capacity so that we can uh, abolish tenders. And that inevitably will uh, deal decisively with the corruption because almost all tenders are given because someone has paid a bribe to supply chain or to the politicians who have got the decision-making power in terms of those tenders. Then the other pillar, uh, number six, is massive development of the African economy and advocating for a move from reconciliation to justice in the entire continent. That we have to appreciate that our development as South Africa cannot be isolated from the development of the entire African continent that we, 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 we have an obligation as revolutionaries, as revolutionary pan-Africanist economic freedom fighters, pan-continental freedom fighters. We should fight for the, the, the liberation and development of the African uh, economy and, 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 and the entire continent. And the, the last pillar is open, accountable, corrupt-free government and society without fear of victimization by state agencies that in the battle, in the war for economic emancipation, we should fight all manifestations of corruption and wrongdoing, that we must have an open government that is accountable, we must have a democratic government. So despite our deep convictions on these ideas, we do not want to impose them on society. We want them to be, to be, democratically, to be democratically established. So that is basically... A, the, the key components of uh, our, 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 our seven cardinal pillars. We must read all of us in detail in terms of what we say we seem to achieve. Now, the complementary pillars are almost all the issues that we get to raise when we, 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 we are now uh, dealing with governance issues and issues of development in society as a whole. So just one thing to highlight, comrades, is that you will notice that in all these cardinal pillars that we have highlighted here, since our arrival in Parliament in 2014, we have been taking up these issues. Expropriation of land without compensation is on the agenda now. There is a process to amend the constitution in South Africa to permit for expropriation of land without compensation. And at the forefront of that struggle is the economic freedom fighters. The nationalization of mines and banks it is the EFF that are currently has tabled motions on, on that aspect of nationalization of the mines and the banks. We even currently have got a bill. Like a bill is a law that is in parliament. It only becomes an act. An act is a law which is signed by a president after parliament has exhausted the process of enriching that. So we have tabled a private member's bill as the economic freedom fighters. One on nationalization of the South African Reserve Bank but two, on creation of a state bank that is going to give access to finance 
for all our people. In terms of free education, we have been at the forefront of the struggle for free education. In terms of industrial development, if you look into the deeper detail of our election manifesto for 2019, we speak specifically in terms of creating special economic zones in all parts of South Africa so that we can empower as many people as possible to produce their own goods and services. We speak about inward industrialization. In terms of uh, the, the building state capacity, uh, you will know, I will speak to that later on when we are responding to one of the questions in terms of what we have done thus far. We have got a, a private member's bill in parliament as well that uh, it is called the insourcing of all government and state entities bill to say that all workers must be insourced so that the government has got capacity to then deal with uh, its own uh, services. In terms of uh, the development of the African economy, we always advocate for the development of the African economy. I will give a clearer context in terms of some of the issues that arise out of that. In terms of our war against corruption, so our fight against all manifestations of corruption are informed by our commitment in the founding manifesto. So as EFF leaders, public representatives, whatever you do, you should appreciate that must be informed by the founding manifesto of the EFF. And in terms of the complementary pillars, which I'm not going to go through in detail, except when it's necessary. Let me just go through them. It's 14 of them. Number one is decentralized social development and building of new cities. That development must not be concentrated in Johannesburg or Houting, must not be concentrated in Cape Town, Western Cape only, or Deben or KwaZulu Natal only. And in and, and KwaZulu Natal, it's even worse because it's just Deben that has got a higher economic activities and some of the ports in, in Richards Bay. We need to des decentralize development. We must build new cities, not just one city. We must build new cities. The founding manifesto already speaks to which areas must be prioritized in terms of building of new cities. I'm sure you will read about that. And then the complementary plan number two is public representatives using public services. That once we have fully developed our healthcare system and our education system, that if you are a president, if you are a mayor, if you are a premier, you are an MEC, you are a minister, you must take your children to public school and you must consistently use public hospitals and clinics. And we we'll then also speak about the reduction of benefits for public representatives, that public representation must not be an act of self-enrichment. It should be service. That whoever joins the EFF should appreciate that you are joining an act of service. You are a servant of the people. You are not some leader who wants to be driving in huge cars and, and, and disregard the people in terms of what should happen. And then the, the, the fourth complementary pillar is progressive internationalism. I'm going to speak to that later. And then there's a, the complementary pillar that speaks to the sports, arts, and culture question. There's a complementary pillar that speaks to the immigration question. There's a complementary pillar that speaks to the monetary and fiscal stability. There is a complementary pillar that speaks to priority of energy, security, and the environment. So, so long before there was this recurrent load shedding, the EFF has, was already calling for energy security and energy mix that includes the usage of coal, uh, nuclear, uh, and, and, and green energy uh, sources. But with the emphasis that we should gradually and grow towards green energy sources uh, and use dependably those so that we, we do not pollute our environment. We then speak also about science and technology and we speak about the support that must be given to research and innovation and enterprise development. And then we speak about making one city the administrative and legislative capital of South Africa. So when we made the input to the SONA debate this year, we then made that call that we need to relocate parliament to Houting so that we can have one area where there is both the legislature and the administration of government. Currently, they are separated. And if you check the history of that, it's because of the colonial and white-only government uh, agreements uh, that happened post the so-called Anglo-Boer War, which was a South African war, 
and a lot of black people lost their lives in that war. And then we speak also about the transformation of the criminal justice system, that the criminal justice system must be more corrective than punitive. And then we speak about the relationship with security forces. So those are the complementary pillars that are outlined in the founding manifesto of the EFF and that they complement the uh, they complement the the key the key uh, non-negotiable cardinal pillars for economic freedom in our lifetime and we must always understand that in context now i want to deal with some of the questions that uh, have been sent via whatsapp by some of the fighters there's a fighter called zolani muba from east london he says good evening fighters mine is not a question but i would like to get clarity on open borders policy as per the stand of the eff so those of you who have got copies of the founding manifesto of the eff i want you to go to paragraph 99 of the founding manifesto of the eff and perhaps we must read it together in terms of uh, what is important paragraph 99 in the founding manifesto of the eff it says the eff will also advocate for the ultimate integration of the african continent through the erosion and ev eventual elimination of unnecessary borders so that is what the eff founding manifesto says that which in the case of south africa will entail that Botswana, Lesotho, and Swaziland borders in a manner that involves the participation of those people should be eroded. This will also be encouraged in other parts of the African continent. And why do we say that? It's because the borders that we have currently are colonial borders. So a group of Europeans met in 1844 in, 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 in Berlin in, in to, to decide that they're going to to, to stratify, they're going to subdivide Africa amongst themselves. So then certain parts of Africa was given to Britain, certain parts were given to Belgium, certain parts were given to Spain, certain parts were given to France. So we, 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 were, we were subdivided to, to these colonial uh, masters. And for a better part of our history as Africans, we were not self-governing. We, our laws had to be passed by those that colonized us. So even what we call South Africa today, the, the Union of South Africa, the Union of South Africa Act had to be passed by British Parliament because we were a colonial entity. And prior that, almost all activities, since the colonial invasion, all of us were under European control. And that is what we want to reverse and, and a struggle should always appreciate that we are not a regionalistic, we're not just a nationalistic organization. We, we are committed to some degree of nationalism that is located within a pan-Africanism. So Julius Nyerere says that nationalism that is not pan-Africanist is dangerous and reactionary. So we will never associate with anyone who thinks that it's only about us and us only. You will not be able to sustainably develop the African continent, even ourselves, if we think that we're just going to lock ourselves up and not interact with other parts of the African continent. And more so that all of us as black people in the world are defeated people. We are, we are, we are, we are almost, if not de facto, a lesser race. Everywhere where black people exist, they are treated with disdain. Everywhere where black people are, are an economic minority. So if the wealth of the world could be quantified to be 1,000 rands, black people in our entirety would not even account for 5 rand of that 1,000 rands. Because we, 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 we are just in service of the white capitalist economic establishment. Everywhere, even if you go to America, like they will count all the richest people. They have, there are very few black people that play an, an important role anywhere in the world. So we have an obligation as well to, uh, to liberate uh, the black race from oppression uh, all, over, all over the world. It is not just about 
our commitment. So if you think that the struggle is about you and you, you, you narrow nationalistic, regionalistic perspective, then you are in the wrong organization because the EFF is a pan-continental progressive, pan-Africanist organization that appreciates that these borders were brought forth by colonial occupiers. The other question that uh, arises uh, comes from uh, the regional secretary of the EFF in Alfred Nzo, Sintembile Madikizela. He says, number 60 talks on establishing and, support and supporting state companies, e.g. state housing company. Can this not be a motion that can be standardized and be raised in all councils where EFF is represented? And, and it maybe it's because Madikizela is not a councillor, but we have since communicated to all our councils that we should, all of us as public representatives of the EFF, table legislations and motions that will seek to insource workers. Joannis Beck councillors have achieved that. Tswane councillors have achieved that. To some extent, the councillors in Nelson Mandela Bay have achieved that. To some extent, the MPLs of the EFF in Kwazo Natal have achieved that. We in the National Assembly have achieved that as well. So it is an obligation because it is consistent with the founding manifesto of the EFF that wherever we are, we can't have cleaners and security guards who are, private, who are, who are employed by private companies. The private company receives 15000 every month for that worker, but only gives the worker like 2000 round or 2500 So the struggle for insourcing falls within the cardinal pillar that speaks about building state capacity, that if you know that you need security on a constant basis, you need people to clean the offices on a constant basis, they must work directly for the municipality or for the provincial government or for national government and all its entities. And that doesn't only limit to security guards and cleaners. It must go to all the other people who work for government, including construction workers, engineers, and everything else that gets to be defined in that particular context. So that question is dealt with in terms of uh, that uh, uh, question. And then the, uh, there's a question that speaks to, was, say, was sent by Fighter Dikosha Pichela from Cape Metro Ward 107, the chairperson of the branch there. He says that government is currently the, the biggest consumer of goods and services worldwide. Therefore, it stimulates vast economic activity which many professional individuals aspire to be part of. Currently in South Africa, the procurement system is merely a perpetuation of exploitation and enrichment of the colonizers. What medal of procurement is envisaged behind the abolishment of tenders? So you, you must look into the, the further expansion of the pillar that deals with land expropriation without compensation in the EFF funding manifesto. We then say that once we have given land to our people, productive land, what should be collectivized should be the bulk support systems like irrigations and thereafter the offtake of whatever the people are producing in those farms. And you must understand that we, 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 government is correctly saying that government is the biggest consumer, for instance, of food products. In South Africa, government buys food for 15 or 14 million or, or, or more uh, school children for, for school feeding schemes, for hospitals, for prisons, for, for government functions, and a variety of things. But if you check where that food comes from, it is imported from Brazil, from Europe, from America. So wh when we have given our people the land, they will then be able to produce the, the, the food, and then the state takes that food and gives to the people. And that will then create a sustainable economic activity that will take our people out of poverty in terms of, a, of what should happen. But also is to emphasize that government should consume only goods and services 
that are locally produced. There is no law that forbids government uh, from doing so. So, I mean, like, how many cars does government own, for instance? Uh, the police vans, the cars that can be used for scholar transport, the ambulances, a variety of them. And South Africa still doesn't have a South African-owned car manufacturing company. We instead are having assemblage points of BMW, of Toyota, of Mercedes-Benz, of VW. And when and we, we take money of government and give those companies as subsidy, they make profits. And where does the profit go? It goes back to their countries. It empowers their countries. They've got maximal revenue as opposed to us who are in dire need of such a revenue as the as 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 a counter so 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 it's, it's one of the things that must be looked into i wouldn't think that it is impossible for south africa to have a south african made car already the workers in port elizabeth in roslyn uh, in 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 Deben, where toyota is assembled have gained some degree of exposure in terms of how cars are made we can learn from those and then we make sure that uh, we produce our own cars, but not only that, a variety of other basic necessities should be produced by our own uh, uh, people. Then the other question that is asked there is in relation to the Sovereign Wealth Fund is asked by Sitelo Gazide from the EFF Student Command. He says he stays in Alexander. So he asked, what about the Sovereign Wealth Fund? Why didn't you establish it? In 1994 so you must go to paragraph 82 of the EFF funding manifesto so that you get a clearer context of what it says and then it says there that owing to surpluses and many sustainable developmental considerations that will be generated as a result of South Africa's state control and ownership of strategic sectors of the economy government should establish a sovereign wealth fund which will prudently invest in the development of the African economy. This fund will also assist in the insulation of the South African economy whenever there are volat volatilities in the resources sector uh, prices and when renewable resources are exhausted. Most countries, including China, the US, Saudi Arabia, Norway, Libya, Chile, France, Nigeria, and many others, have sovereign wealth funds for these purposes. As we speak, despite massive resources uh, in South Africa, we still have no sovereign wealth fund because we do not own our own resources. So what is important about the sovereign wealth fund is that we should own and control our natural resources. The state must own the mines. And you know, one thing which is one of the most tragic developments in South Africa's politics in the past few years is that there was an amendment to the current law that governs minerals and petroleum resources in South Africa. So the Minerals and Petroleum Resources Development Act, when it was passed, it correctly and progressively shifted mineral rights from private individuals to collective state ownership. So the state is a custodian of all minerals in South Africa. Whoever wants to mine needs to get a permission from the state on certain conditions in terms of what uh, should happen. I see Commissar Bussin has joined us. So, so the, the, the state is custodian of all mineral resources in South Africa, but it doesn't own the mines. There's a very small mining company called African Exploration and Finance Mining Company which produces very small components of coal that is utilized by ESCOM. But otherwise, we need a state-owned mining company. We, we need the state to be exposed to the control and ownership of the mines. So the amendment of the MPRDA, which I just spoke about now, was beginning to say that let us pass a law that all the new mine uh, minerals and uh, petroleum resources projects should have a minimum of 30% state ownership. In the founding manifesto of the EFF, we say a minimum of 51% ownership of all the mineral discoveries and petroleum resources. And, 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 and those of you who have not been paying attention, you will realize that we have got massive petroleum resources 
uh, in South Africa, this discovery of huge oil reserves in the sea in the Southern Cape, which can, can, can last us for many years to come. We have got energy sources, like in terms of coal, which if it's made clean, can sustain us with electricity and the entire African continent for not less than 200 to 300 years. So that is what we have. We've got a lot of resource capacity and, and we need to maximally utilize all those resources to empower our economy, to drive economic development, to integrate the entire African continent in a way that is much more uh, developmental. Now, the other question which seems to be a common theme from all the fighters that have sent questions. There's a lot of fighters who have sent questions and we appreciate. It's a, we, we, we are being asked to respond to why did we choose Marxism, Leninism, and the Fanonian school of thought as our guide to action and tools of analysis. Why, why did we choose those thought processes, those ideas, those ideologies, those scientific sciences as the basis of our ideology. And, and the reason is because we argue that Marxism, Marxism, Leninism is science. So we, we have to rely on scientifically proven theories to guide our actions. We cannot just rely on what people mistakenly think is common sense. You know, sometimes people get misled that no, it's just common sense that People uh, must be rich and then the others must work for the rich. It's not common sense. The science which is called Marxism-Leninism that disputes that, that illustrates to us that we are in a class struggle. Just before I give you a context of why, why did we choose Marxism and Leninism and the Fanonian school of thought, I want to give you a context that science refers to knowledge that has been gained through observation, has been proven and has been found to be true beyond any reasonable doubt so you know so there is physical sciences there is mathematical sciences then there is social sciences so 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 socialism and scientific socialism is guided by the science of marxism and leninism in the context within which we are locating that as the economic freedom fighters and what do we learn from karl marx we learn the simple fact that our society is divided into class into classes that we're in a class struggle the class character of our struggle so our fight for economic freedom is a class struggle it's not a struggle that is existing to unite all classes it is a class struggle we are on the side of the working class so in a class struggle there are contending forces there are those who are fighting on the other side. There are those who are fighting on the other side. So in our case, we, we, we are engaged in a class struggle and our side is the working class and the poor. And who is our enemy? Is the bourgeoisie, the capitalist, those who own the means of production. Those who do not have to work, they just call all of us to work for them so that they become rich. They are wealthy, even if they do not generate any income tomorrow they will live the exact same lifestyles they're living for the rest of, the, of their lives. But all of us, including some of us who are employed, who are part of the working class, who are part of the proletariat. And sometimes fighters mistaken these things. They think that councillors and MPLs and MPs are no longer part of the working class. They're no longer part of the working class and the proletariat and the poor. They are. What distinguishes them from the, the rest of the unemployed population is just that monthly wage. You take it away, you're back to the same conditions as everyone else. So we represent the class that is not owning the means of production. That is what defines us as the economic freedom fighters. And for us to understand the class character of our struggle, we have to utilize Marxism. But also Karl Marx teaches us about capitalism. So of, of all the things that Karl Marx wrote about, he, he wrote substantially about capitalism, its fictitious nature, and how uh, public debt is managed, a variety of other components. We need to, later on, when we go deeper in terms of the contextualization of Marxism, 
we will we'll read all the perspectives, including the, the, the writings on capital that they properly locate the capitalism. So from Marx, we learn the class character of our struggle. We learn about the nature and form of capitalism. We learn about historical materialism as well, which we will uh, explain. And what do we learn from Lenin? What does Lenin teach us? Lenin teaches us the practice of socialism. Because Lenin led a socialist struggle that established one of the most powerful socialist republics in the world, in Russia. So the 1917 Greatest October Socialist Revolution was led by Vladimir Lenin, who was a Marxist, unapologetically, and said that we are going to establish a socialist state based on the Marxist understanding of history. But in the process of establishing that state, he was able to develop a lot of clearer theoretical perspectives in terms of what should happen. And one of those in terms of the practice of socialism was that a lot of people were, were, were used to believe in the past that socialism is just to say, let's immediately collectivize. Like, like if you, you, you find wealth and you find the economy, you just want to rush for collective ownership without developing the productive forces. Then Lenin appreciated that we need to necessarily develop the productive forces, meaning that we must build more industries, we must build technology, we must make sure that our people gain access to uh, as much uh, material economic expansion as possible so that they are not compelled to work in terms of uh, what we should do. But also from Lenin we learn the theory of organization so and the manner in which the EFF is organized. We are a Leninist organization. So the key principles that you find in the EFF constitution are Leninist principles, the powers of national uh, conference, democratic centralism. Democratic centralism that basically says that once decisions have been taken by the collective, your right to defy as an individual dwindles into insignificance. So you never ever as a member of the organization, as, as a fighter, think that, no, now I think that we must not uh, pursue progressive internationalism. We must not uh, fight a pan-continental struggle. And then you go to Facebook and insult leadership that is articulating an organizational position. That is an organizational position. So decisions of upper structures are binding on lower structures and once decisions are taken, your right to differ dwindles into insignificance. But that does not take away your organizational democratic right to contribute to the key components of what the organization stands for. That is why from time to time, we've got branch people's assemblies, branch general assemblies, regional people's assemblies, regional general assemblies, and now we're going to have provincial general assemblies who are now in the terms of the new constitution going to have a national general assembly which deliberate on policy positions and sharpen them of the EFF consistent with the founding manifesto in terms of what should happen. So that democratic centralism principle is part of what we have learned from Lenin in terms of how an organization of the working class should be organized. So that is part of what we learn from Lenin. But what else do we learn from Lenin? We learn a proper characterization of the state. We learn a proper characterization of what is this thing called the state. So the state refers basically to what is government, parliament, the judiciary, the police, the army, and in some instances it includes what is called the fourth state, like the fourth state, the the media and the, the, those are representatives of the state. So that, com that, that, that combination, all of it is the state. Now Lenin says in State and Revolution that the state comes out of the fact that you cannot reconcile the class differences that exist in a class divided society. So we said earlier that Karl Marx teaches us about the class character of a struggle that we are engaged in a class struggle, that the, the history of the thus far existing society is the history of class struggle. Then Lenin says that the state emerges out of the fact that 
you cannot reconcile, you can never ever reconcile the interest of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, which, which are called the, the capitalist and the working class, that you can never reconcile. Then the state tries to emerge in the middle as a reconciler of those two components in terms of um, what should happen. So he says instead of revolution that the state is a product of the irreconcilability of class antagonisms. But it doesn't end there. He then characterizes that despite the fact that the state emerges out of the irreconcilability of class antagonisms, it is an instrument of the dominant class rule, that the class that is dominant in whatever epoch utilizes the state to manage its own affairs. Karl Marx says that then the government, like the government that the executive in a, in a capitalist state is nothing but a committee that manages the common affairs of the bourgeoisie, of the capitalists. So that is what we learn from Lenin that in South Africa, you have got the government or the executive that is basically managing the common affairs of the bourgeoisie. So everything else that they do, they seek to protect the private property and the capitalist riches of the establishment. So the laws, the, the constitution in its current form basically exists to protect the establishment in the manner in which it is. <clears throat> now, what do we do? We then are fighting as the economic freedom fighters. One, to have strong organizational power in order to mobilize the masses behind the ideals of economic freedom in our lifetime. One who must have the strong organization. So the daily things that you do of going to build branches, of recruiting members, is essential in the work of the economic freedom fighters. So you, you can't be a, a fighter who is not recruiting members every day and, and, and reproducing yourself ideologically. You cannot be a fighter that is barren. You cannot be a fighter who doesn't reproduce yourself. I, I'm still on Lenin, but I want to give you this context quickly. That you, you, you have to reproduce yourself ideologically. You must convince as many people as possible to believe in the struggle for economic freedom in our lifetime. So that we can have a strong organization. Strong organization will give us access to the masses. You cannot mobilize the masses without organizational power. So you need organization to mobilize the masses so that you can win political power. And winning political power, we say that we, we will fight for political power through democratic elections. But whenever the democratic space is deprived, we as the EFF are going to fight for political power by any other revolutionary means possible. And that revolutionary means possible must always involve the masses. So there's no shortcut towards freedom. There's no shortcut towards freedom. We are going to use all revolutionary means possible, but the masses must be the organizational power, mass power, political power. And political power will give us access to the state. Then we then use the state now as an instrument of working class rule. So we understand that the state is a product of the irreconcilability of class antagonisms, but it is an instrument of dominant class rule. Once we have one political power, the state will become an instrument of working class rule. It is sometimes referred to as the dictatorship of the proletariat. So it's dictatorship of the majority to say that now let us begin to take the land and give to all our people. Let us take the economy to give to all our people. Let us democratically industrialize to create sustainable jobs for people. Let us provide free quality education, health care, sanitation, housing for all our people. That is what we, 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 we stand for. And we learn that component from Lenin who speaks about the state and revolution. What do we learn from uh, Fanon? Fanon teaches us the anti-colonial character of the struggle for economic freedom in our lifetime. So we to appreciate the class character of our struggle. We also appreciate from Fanon that it has to be an anti-colonial and, and somehow nationalist struggle, 
We appreciate that we are black people. We are not apologetic about that. So even our commitment to non-racialism, it's, it's not in a manner in which deprives the fact that at the end of the day, our struggle is about the emancipation of black people and Africans in particular. I've already spoken to the context of why we as Africans all over the world are still under oppression. We are, we are still a lesser race. So our struggle has to be located. So we utilize, and we do not want to just to be emotional about it and, and without the contextualizing our struggle for, for economic freedom. So that is the context, comrades, that um, we are fighting for, for, for our freedom. And, and the most important thing which we have highlighted is we need maximum discipline as fighters, as those of us who ascribe to the struggle for total emancipation. And, and in one of the deliberations that uh, we, we held in the central command team of the economic freedom fighters, we said that the two major threats to the struggle for economic freedom, one is laziness, two is opportunism. But we also said that three will be to ideologically zigzag. So one is laziness, two is opportunism, three is to ideologically zigzag, to be not stable organizationally. So if you are lazy, if you can't speak to people, if you can't persuade people, you must know that uh, you are not a fighter, you don't belong to the generation of economic freedom fighters. If, if, if you are an opportunist, who can work very hard, but every time you, you find an opportunity, it's about self-promotion or it's about self-enrichment. You then do not fall in the fold of the economic emancipation movement. If, if, if you use the organization for individual benefits, it's opportunism, you do not form part of the organization. But the third component that is a threat to the struggle for economic freedom is to zigzag. The reason why the constitution, the founding manifesto of the EFF says that the, 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 the seven cardinal pillars are non-negotiable is because we do not want one day those who are going to lead the EFF to come and say, no, maybe this thing of taking the land is not necessary. Maybe let us look into paying some of these uh, people money for this and that and that. It is non-negotiable in the EFF that we should expropriate land without compensation for equal redistribution. It is non-negotiable in the EFF that we should nationalize the banks, the mines and other strategic sectors of the economy without compensation. It is non-negotiable in the EFF that we should abolish tenders, we must build state capacity with the aim of abolishing tenders. It is non-negotiable in the EFF that we must pursue massive protected industrialization to create millions of jobs. It is non-negotiable in the EFF that we should provide free quality education, health care, houses and sanitation for all. It is non-negotiable in the EFF that we should pursue a struggle that develops the entire African continent. It is not, non it's not negotiable in the EFF that we must fight for an open, accountable and corrupt free government. Those are the seven cardinal pillars of the struggle that we stand uh, by. I think comrades who have responded to some of the questions and one of the key appeals that we want to make is that whenever we ask questions, we must identify ourselves. There's a WhatsApp number which we have given. We must continue to send questions for the next readings so that we, we, we respond relevantly to all the, the questions. I mean, like the, the, some of the fighters, I understand that they are burning issues that we are confronted with now. But we should always ask, we must be most relevant when we, we, we are in the process, we are in a political education uh, digital classroom now. So we must be relevant in terms of the questions that we ask. When we say today we are dealing with the funding manifesto, let us deal with that. The next uh, engagement will be on the frequently asked questions on Marxism. We must interact with that. 
and then when we then later on deal with state and revolution, we must deal with that. Uh, we, we, mu we must not be all over. We must not be all over because we're going to lose the context of what we're dealing with. And as we said, our engagement, the number that we're going to receive the WhatsApp messages on is 084-440-8948. Zero eight four 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 zero eight nine four eight. So let us send the questions, and we must we must identify ourselves. We must say that my name is so and so. I want to understand these uh, questions. So let us all of us go and now engage. Uh, let's read the the frequently asked questions on Marxism. There is a document which Commissar uh, Mbuseni has been circulating. So you must uh, in that WhatsApp number we gave now send a text message to ask for the documents which we're engaging in now so that we are able to all of us receive the documents and engage on all these key issues comrades this struggle is winnable we just have to adhere to all these principles that we speak about we have to be disciplined we have to be focused we must not be lazy in the struggle for economic freedom thank you very much for all of us who have been engaging in this process uh, and, and I'm sure that there are, there are further questions that you might need to ask. You must go to Twitter, hashtag EFF Book Club. You ask the question, someone else will respond to you. Someone else might explain better than we have done so today. And, and political education is a constant thing. If you do not understand something today, you must rest assured that in the future you will understand it. You will be able to articulate it in a clear and a and, and decisive, uh, persuasive, cogent format. So thank you very much, comrades, for coming through and uh, fight us and all. I saw some uh, people from uh, the other side, they came to learn as well. It's good because in the EFF, our role is to learn, to learn, and to learn, as Lenin said. Thank you very much.